Pharisees and the scribes. This meeting is being recorded. Yes. Thank you, Zoom. Um, it does that, doesn't it? I forgot about that noise. Um, the scribes and the Pharisees are being exposed as Jesus speaks and as Jesus ministers. It's quite clear in chapter three that, the, that their attitude to Jesus has gone very dark, very fast. In fact, it's quite clear that scribes, the scribes, remember, are the, the leaders of the Jewish way of teaching, the Jewish way of thinking. The scribes train Pharisees and the Pharisees go out and they work in synagogues and in towns and in villages and they teach people what the scribes have taught them. And scribes have come now from Jerusalem because Jesus is getting popular and they hate him. It's quite plain. If you look at the text in front of you, they hate him and they accuse him of spiritual darkness. But it is an irony, if you look at this passage, that what they're accusing him of is exactly what is in their hearts. You know, they come. Do you know what they do at the beginning here? I find it disgusting. They watch Jesus in case he would heal someone on the Sabbath. What an awful thing Jesus must have done to want to bring freedom to people whose lives were broken. How sad and dreadful have you got to be to have come all the way to, from Jerusalem to watch this man in case he does something to help someone. Because that's what Jesus did. He came to help and to heal, to show people God's way. You know what? Soon we see, even in Mark 3, they begin to conspire, to conspire to kill him. They call him unclean. They call him demon-possessed. And you know what? What I would encourage us to do when we see this attitude is we should lament at the hardness of the heart that is in people and how hardness destroys human hearts. You know, even this morning, I was on Facebook looking for something um, and I saw a message from a lady saying, I don't know what we did. And I was reading this, you know, sometimes you read Facebook and you think that was useful, that was terrible. Why would you post that? But there was a lady fretting because her and her husband had been driving their car and they pulled out of someone's way so that they could come past and the person spat through the window at them as they pulled out of the way and she said what did we do wrong and there's all these people um using all kinds of choice language i'll, I'll admit i was like well we're going for it today then are we facebook but the truth is they did nothing wrong but the person that drove past them that did that has a darkness in their heart, a darkness in their heart, which needs Jesus to come to, to minister to. And here we see Jesus has come that even these scribes might have life, but their darkness in their hearts holds them back from the miracle worker. And you know what? Darkness can exist in any of our hearts if we give it space, if we give it room. See, Jesus comes and he comes to bring life. He comes to heal. And we see that part of the group. And then we see this other part of this crowd who are adoring Jesus. They're adoring him for the miracles that he did. You know, I said this last week. When you free people from sickness, when you free people from disease, from spiritual oppression, it's natural that people wanted to be near Jesus. Jesus understands that the crowd is very fickle. He understands that many of them are hungry in their stomachs for actual food. So they chase him because he can produce miracles where they're fed. He can produce miracles where they're made well. But he still helps them, even in those crises that they have. He doesn't discount them because they're not honest about why they're there. He offers them love. They want freedom. And why not? Because, you know, if you've got an ailment, why wouldn't you want to be free from it? And people were chasing Jesus because um, they, see, they saw him as an oasis in the desert of life. They saw him as one who could come and make them better than they were. And what we see in Jesus, though, is one who didn't come to make the miracle the destination. The miracles that Jesus did were mechanisms. They were mechanisms in order that those people might be set free from spiritual oppression, might be made well, in order what? In order that they might hear the gospel, in order that they might receive the gospel. You know, um, 
we've been doing Copper and Company on a Wednesday for th three weeks now, three, three. And it's, it's very small. We haven't had any visitors this time around yet, but as we keep doing that, people will come. And what's the purpose? It's not because we need to get rid of tea and coffee. We want to build relationships with people. We want to build relationships with people that they might come in this place and they might meet us and they might see the life of God coming out of us and it might be life for them, you know? Um, and it's a big deal. I was thinking about this. You know what? If I gave all of you 10 pounds, I don't have 10 pounds for each of you. I just want to say that I've got, I'm married, as you know, and I've got two children. I don't have 10 pounds for each of you. But if I gave you all 10 pounds and said, go and put a bet on at the bookies, some of you would do it easy. Some of you would find it hard. It's hard to come into a church. So let's keep praying for people. When we have a holiday club in a week's time, some of those kids will come in skipping and, and laughing. Some of the parents will go away skipping and laughing because they'll be like, they're gone for three hours. Yes. Some of them will find it hard. It is a bridge that people cross, some with ease and some with difficulty to come into a church. And as we see people come in, we must love them, make that bridge easy for them to cross so that the mechanisms that we use enable them to have a moment where they meet Jesus or many moments because statistics say people often have between five and ten good encounters with Jesus before they begin to understand and accept who he is. So it takes time. So here we go. Um, showing people love is a powerful tool. And I remember um, my friend Andy Kennedy, and some of you might remember Andy came um, when I started here, first of all, and um, you might remember because he had one of my friend's children standing on his shoulders on the stage here. Um, and Andy talks about demonstrations of love a lot. And I remember something very powerful about their street work because they took church onto the streets of Glasgow. And once Andy told me, we've had some complaints. And I was like, well, what did you do? You know, because uh, I remember getting a complaint once when um, an egg went on a girl's skirt in, in a church activity that I was doing. And her mum and dad were, they're not going to watch this, so it's fine. Um, the mum and dad were quite angry with me. And I was like, she tried to catch it. I don't know what you want me to say at this point, but the, the egg went on the skirt. Well, Andy had a complaint one day. And you know what? The, the person said to him, you stop doing this street church. And he was thinking, well, what have I done? What, you know, are we doing something dangerous? And he said, well, what do you mean? And he said, you're giving our children hope. You stop doing that because this is all we've got. And isn't it sad that that's the reality in some people's hearts, even in our world, even around us, even in fairly well-to-do more than in other areas, that some people think this is all they've got. Don't offer more to people. But we are here to offer more. We are here to offer more. We offer to offer more as Jesus did, because Jesus came, as John's, John 1 says, he was in the world, and the world came through him, but the world didn't know him. But he came to, that was his own, and his own people, most of them did not accept him. But to all who receive him, to all who believe in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, children born not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of a man but born of God. See, Jesus came in Mark 3, and at the end we see this quite clearly, to create a new permanent family that all who trust in him enter into. His own family here in Mark 3 are caught up in the bandwagon um, thinking he's doolally. There's something wrong with him. We've got to go and get Jesus. We need to do an intervention. I don't know if any of you have ever done an intervention, Nobody would put the hand up if they've been intervened upon. But um, they think they've got to go and rescue Jesus because he's going mad. Because what's happening? Well, everybody within 50 miles is going where he is. So his mum and his brothers are going, we need to rescue him. Bad stuff is going to happen to Jesus. It could happen to us. We need to basically go and grab him. What do they say? Um, they say, we're going to go and we're going to find him. But again, there's such a crowd there, they can't get near him. The crowd is so dense, they can't get near him. And from outside, they're saying, we need to get to Jesus. We need to rescue him. We need to take him home. He needs to have a lie down. He's going crazy. And they're brought into this 
view that Jesus is doing bad things. They've lost the point. But Jesus wants to teach people what his family is. And this is what he says in verse 33. Who are my mothers? Who is my mother? And who are my brothers and sisters? And he looked at those who sat around him and he said, here are my mother and my brothers and sisters. Here on Zoom, here in this room, we are the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Because who are the brothers and sisters of Jesus? Verse 35, whoever does the will of God. It's very simple. Who are the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ? It's not about being a member of a church. It's about those who do the will of God. That's what qualifies us. And why do we have membership then? Well, we need membership because we need to be able to govern and make decisions. Church membership is important. Um, but what is most important for Christians is that we do the will of God. And the will of God is um, both simple and complicated. It is one thing and it is multifaceted. Why give one answer when you can give two? That was Jesus's best way. Jesus was asked one question, he usually give two answers. But I want to remind you that in doing the will of God, what Jesus is saying is the people who are my brothers and sisters are, are the ones who do the will of God. And in that, first Jesus honors the Father. Jesus always honors the Father first and foremost. In John's gospel, he says, I can only do what I see the Father doing. Now, what a boast that would be from our lips. But what Jesus means is he knows that the Father is the great evangelist. The Father has been always the one trying to reconcile the world to himself, reconcile, you know, to rescue, to set free from sin and death and the power of Satan. So the Father's always been trying to do that, and Jesus can only do that. And here's the Father's will just in some bites, just some pieces for us to remember. It is the Father's will that no one perishes. It is the Father's will that all people are saved by grace through faith in the Son. And the people who are saved aren't just saved, but they move from salvation um, to maturity, where they live in the truth, where righteousness comes out in their choices, in their actions, in their walk, in their lives. See, many people can say yes to Jesus, but what um, makes us brothers and sisters of Jesus is that we live out and do the will of God. It is God's will that not a person on this planet would perish, but once we are saved, we then have to follow. That's why he is our savior and our Lord. You know this stuff. So that's the first thing about the will of God. The father doesn't want anyone to perish. But then in 2 Corinthians 5, we're told that those who do the will of God are new creations. We are new creations who are to clothe ourselves in righteous walking, righteous paths, the scriptures say. New creations who must imitate what we see Jesus saying and doing. One of the things in YWAM, when I was a missionary in Youth of the Mission, that he always used to say, and it's incredibly disgustingly descriptive, is that you and I should be Jesus with skin on to people. And I like that image, but it also, I find it a bit weird. But it is by you and me that people work out what Jesus is like. Because yes, they could go and watch a film about Jesus, but how do most people learn anything about Jesus? How Christians behave what we do, what we say, how we talk, how we act, all of these things. The Father's will, some more. It is the Father's will that in every situation, in each circumstance, this is a good one, I love this one, that we give thanks and give God glory. So it is the Father's will that in your, uh, I was joking with Neil earlier about, Neil's got some challenges with his breathing and I said it's good that it's autonomic because it just happens anyway doesn't it because I wouldn't want him to forget or anything but um, in every situation in every circumstance it is the father's will that you and I give thanks um, to him that's challenging isn't it that's challenging it's, it's hard to be a people of gratitude it's easy when it's easy but it's tough when it's tough and and um, sometimes 
it's sometimes we can get lost, we can get turned around, we can get off track. But it's the Father's will that in every situation, in every circumstance, we give thanks to him, we give glory to God. You know, one of the most powerful testimonies that I hear in people who are under persecution is not one specific person's testimony. It's that again and again, the same strand goes through. They cling on to God and they continue to trust. They give thanks. I remember a story specifically of a Chinese family that were being persecuted and they were targeting the children. And the children said, mommy, they're, they're, they're hurting us, but we won't give them the satisfaction. We'll keep saying thank you to God, even when they hurt us. And it broke my heart to, to listen to children have to experience that, to have to say that. But they were saying, no matter what, we'll give thanks. And it is the Father's will for you and I to keep giving thanks. And so a practical step, because that is tough. That is one of the reasons why a daily practice of prayer is so important for us as Christians. It's hard if you're just in the humdrum to always give thanks. But if you take time every day to stop, to talk to God, to thank God for being with you in the challenges, to thank God for helping you in the things that have gone well, to thank God that he was with you and he still loves you in your failings. If you take time to confess, if you take time to be still, to listen, if you have um, the chance to be before God, the, the Psalms talk about ascribing, and I've said this before, you can only ascribe if you're on your face. You get down before God. Now, some of you might go, Ken, I can't get down, because if I get down, I won't get back up again. That's fine. But in your spirit, submit yourselves to God in humility and say, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, for I am listening. See, prayer is a powerful part of engaging ourselves with the will of the Father. And the other powerful part, which is just as important, is spiritual feeding that we might take the word into our hearts every day that we might feed on the scriptures and not just go well that's what ken said but actually have it open for yourself don't trust me seriously uh, sometimes i get it right sometimes i get it wrong you need to get your food from the lord every day to open up your bible and say to him lord speak to me and if you're not sure where to start with that we can help you with that too because the Father's will is that we are spiritually well, which means prayer, which means um, feeding. And there's also, um, as part of this, it kind of, it's kind of a bit like the nutshell, really. Um, having trusted the Lord for salvation, we keep offering our bodies, as Romans 12 says, being spiritual sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, to offer ourselves in worship. Um, so that's, that's what the Father's will is. No one should perish, that new creations should live as new creations, that we should spiritually discipline ourselves and pray and feed on him and offer our bodies. I want to encourage you. Jesus has called you to be part of his new family. Jesus has called you to be part of his new family and the grace of God is vast for us through Jesus Christ because we don't get it right all of the time. You know what? People in our world make lofty claims and outrageous things like we'll give the NHS 350 million pounds a day. They say lots of crazy things. Jesus never spoke crazy. Jesus always came in to allay our fears, to allay our worries. Jesus shows us how to be the family of God how to live by the word and deed. Jesus is recorded in our gospels with integrity. And you know what? In, in, God's, sorry, in John's gospel, we're reminded he never left us as orphans. We talk sometimes in church about the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus went away that we might have the Holy Spirit come and um, we not be left as orphans. And in heaven, before the throne of God, as we've sung, Jesus stands there as our advocate. But here on earth, perpetually in the gap, the spirit of God is to be with Christians, to be with us. But we need clean hearts. We need clean hearts to hear the spirit speak. To be part of the family of God is the most immense privilege. We are here 
to rub shoulders with all these not yets, that they might come into the family of God. Let God do his work. Let the victory come to Jesus as we're showing people good Christianity. There's times when the world has seen a lot of bad Christianity, but just as me and my German friends are not the same as our great grandparents were who shot at each other, we're not bound by the bad Christianity. We can be good Christians as we do the will of God, as we trust in the will of God. See, the Holy Spirit comes to everyone who's born again. And everyone who's born again will have the wisest counselor, the one who will lead us on the narrow path. Praise be to Jesus who says that we're his brothers and sisters. Praise be to Jesus who can help us do the will of God because we've got more chance of winning eight gold medals each. Uh, than we have of doing the will of God on our own. It's only through him, but it's all possible through him. So let's trust in him. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with the grace now. We're not going to sing, but um, we're going to close by saying the grace together and um, the children are going to come back. Um, And you're more than welcome to stay for tea and coffee. You can use a mask or not. Um, but um, it's been a while since we've said the grace in church. Do you remember the words? I don't know if they're going to be on. Are they going to be on the screen? They are. Praise the Lord. Occasionally I forget. I've got them here just in case. So let's say the, the words of the grace to each other. And we'll say them to you on the Zoom as well. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit Be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You you are allowed to greet each other with hugs and other appropriate gestures. If people want that, then um, by all means do. But have a chat. And um, some people won't have seen some of the people in here for a while. But God bless you this week.